Welcome to section 4.21 on genetic disorders. Okay, for genetic disorders, these are going to be screw-ups that happen somewhere along the way, either in the chromosome amount that you have or in the particular version of a gene that you have. Uh, these are going to be ones that are universally going to be harmful. Uh, these are ones to be a disorder that typically don't have a benefit that we could see as being possible. Uh, whereas some other traits, you know, like being hairy or something, could be possible if the environment shifts. Most of these are going to make you more unhealthy, kind of regardless of what's going on. And because they tend to make you more unhealthy, you'll see that most genetic mutations that lead to a disorder are going to be recessive. That's the type of allele that they will possess. Obviously, if they're chromosomal, we have an extra chromosome. That works a bit differently. But if it's a gene, it typically will be recessive. Now, with this, we're going to just look at a chart. I'm going to go over some basic genetic disorders. Uh, I've just kind of picked a selection of different types just to get you familiar with them. So Marfan syndrome is where you have a screw up with your connective tissue. That's the stuff that kind of helps hold your body together. And this leads to you having very long limbs with very long thin fingers. Now that's not a huge deal in and of itself, but the other problem is you tend to get heart and bone issues from this. And so especially as you get older, this tends to shorten your lifespan. Now, it doesn't shorten it to the point that you can't reproduce. So this is actually autosomal dominant, which you don't see that much, but it works because it doesn't harm you that much, especially not until maybe you're dying at 50 or 60 instead of 70 or 80, but you can still have kids, etc. so this is able to perpetuate itself. Sickle cell anemia, we're going to call autosomal recessive just because for purposes of getting the disease, you have to have two sickle cell alleles to get it. If you have, if you're a carrier, if you have heterozygote, or if you are homozygous dominant for healthy, both of those individuals will not suffer from sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia, whichever you want to call it. And what happens there is you get these messed up, sickle-ish shaped blood cells that tend to die earlier, leading to a lack of blood cells, as well as they tend to clog, which leads to things like organ failure. And this can, without treatment, kill you, certainly by the end of your teens. And so this one does need to be recessive. If it was dominant, it probably would have just worked its way out of our genome. Vitamin D resistant rickets is where you can't properly store calcium in your bones. Your bones tend to be softer and more flexible. This can lead to them flexing, so you get stuff like bow legs. Uh, this one is X-link dominant because it doesn't outright kill you once again. It just makes it where you might look a little bit weird if you're looking at their legs especially. Uh, and this one's kind of cool because it is X-linked as well, so it's a sex link trait. And so this one is actually gotten more commonly by females. I know we said before sex link traits are normally by males, but because this one's dominant, males only have one chance to get the dominant, females have two. And because the dominant's bad, if they get even a single dominant, they have rickets. So this is kind of cool where at least for once you're not screwing males with this whole sex link genes. In this case, it would be females. And then hemophilia type A, we discuss this a bit where you can't properly clot blood, so bruising or cuts can lead to dying from blood loss. And so this one will once again be mostly male because it's X-linked recessive. So this one will follow the normal pattern we've seen with sex linkage where males are more affected. Now, chromosomal mutations, if you have three copies of chromosome 21, you have Down syndrome, and that leads to slower mental abilities. It also leads to certain characteristic appearances, especially within the face, where you can oftentimes identify a Down's person just by looking at their facial structure. You've got Turner syndrome, where you only have one X. You don't have another X or a Y. That's why it's oftentimes written X0, just to be like, there's nothing there or XO if you want, whatever. And so these will be females that tend to be shorter. They sometimes will have like a webbing with their neck. Uh, they in some cases can have very mild mental retardation and infertility. Triple X syndrome is where you have three Xs. So instead of taking one away, we've now added one. And for the most part, these will be relatively normal females with very, very mild mental delays sometimes. So we're talking just a tiny amount, not where you would be incapable of getting along. Uh, and they can oftentimes have menstrual irregularities. So you've got some protein issues that might be going on, so you're not going to have a normal monthly menstrual pattern. And then Klinefelter syndrome, this is going to be where you get a Y, but then you get more than one X. And so because you have a Y, you will be male, but you tend to produce, because of all those Xs, less testosterone, less male hormone, if you will. So your male characteristics tend to be a little bit less pronounced, and some of your more feminine characteristics can be a bit more pronounced. You are not a hermaphrodite, you don't have two sets of genitalia, nothing like that, 
uh, basically it's just going to be you're a slightly more effeminate male and so it can lead to some issues especially with things like fertility or development of those secondary male characteristics that make you look you know really masculine and then to diagnose these things if you want to find out if something like non-disjunction has occurred this is where when your body's going through uh, mitosis, meiosis, it screws up and it doesn't separate sister chromatids. So you end up getting extra chromosomes in one of them, in one cell, and you get fewer in the other. And so we can do a karyotype, which is just an image at metaphase that shows all the chromosomes, so we can pair them up and line them up to see if there's something wrong with our chromosomes. So in this case, you can see this is a Down syndrome child, and they have three copies of chromosome 21, called trisomy 21. So the karyotype can allow us to identify these chromosomal issues. You can also, while in the womb, take a needle. You can take that needle and using ultrasound to protect the baby, insert it into the woman's abdomen, into the amniotic sac. You then extract some fluid which contains skin cells that the baby is like just constantly sloughing off like we are. And then you can do genetic tests on those cells. So you can try to see if they have certain gene-related disorders or if they've got via karyotype some type of non-disjunction issue, a chromosomal issue. Regardless, if you just know you have a certain propensity to have a child with a disease, or if you found that your child does have one, you can seek genetic counseling where they can go through some of your options. So in some places, you might have the option to abort if it's during a pregnancy, or you can certainly decide whether or not you want to have more kids based upon what the odds are of everything. And really, the only way to try to potentially fix things after the fact would be gene therapy. And this is something that's currently still being worked on. It's in its infancy, but it's using something like a virus to go in and inject into your cells as a child or adult a healthy version of a gene to fix the disorder. Now, some people have died during testing of this, so it's not currently being you know, full steam ahead used because there are still safety precautions. But at least for the future, this is probably the most promising thing that there is, at least for gene-related disorders, not necessarily chromosomal, uh, because they could go through and potentially fix things after the fact. So if your amniocentesis came up, you could just do an injection, and then by the time the baby's born, it could be theoretically healed, and you wouldn't have to worry about the disorder.